everyone. Thanks for being here. While a lot has happened over the last week, including the supermajority overriding most of my vetoes, costing Vermonters hundreds of millions in new taxes, fees, penalties, and unsustainable spending in the coming years, we wanted to focus today on some changes to the pandemic housing program or the hotel motel program as it's commonly called. But before we do, as a reminder, one of those bills I vetoed was the state budget, which was because of a $20 million unnecessary increase in DMV fees and a 13% increase in annual spending. Unfortunately, the legislature wasn't interested in addressing those concerns, but after a political flare up at the end of the session, they were interested in discussing the pandemic housing program. Now, what was interesting about the housing bill, H-171, which I signed today, was that for the first and only time this session, legislative leaders were willing to negotiate with us and pass a bill that gave us tools to ease this transition and address the issue of permanent housing at the same time. Secretary Samuelson and Commissioner Hanford will outline some of the specifics from this bill as well as an update on the work we've been doing. But in summary, instead of transitioning back to our pre-pandemic program in its entirety on July 1, which was what the legislature had passed unanimously in the Budget Adjustment Act in March, participants will be able to uh, stay eligible until we find an option for them. Importantly, it gives us more tools, including investments we'd asked for during the session for permanent housing and requirements that those in the program work with us to find a solution. Overall, we believe this is a good step forward, which we can fund with existing resources rather than diverting it from other investments. And I appreciate the collaboration, at least on this one. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Samuelson. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Governor, for the opportunity um, to update Vermonters on the pandemic era housing program. Moving, or, moving forward, AHS will provide these updates on a weekly basis on information related to the program, and more information in addition to that is going to be available on the DCF website. The pandemic era hotel and motel program has changed many times during um, my time as Deputy Secretary and Secretary. Each time, we have evolved to meet these changes, doing our best to assist those who are experiencing homelessness. But now with H-171, which the governor has just signed, this is a collaborative effort between the administration and the legislature to better serve Vermonters in the General Assistance Housing Program by connecting them with services and supports and not just rooms. This latest change provides us with a, with a longer runway to engage those living in the hotels, getting them into services and the programs they need to support them in finding and keeping housing. To maintain eligibility, clients must engage with a housing provider and case manager to develop a, to develop a plan that will assist them in making the transition to permanent housing. And this is a significant update. It is important to recognize that each month's households have been entering and leaving the program over the past three years, including over this past month. We have been working to engage these individuals in case management and care coordination um, and to identify and, and connect them with services. H-171 actually stops and defines this population and allows us to clearly focus resources to those who are in the program on July 1. It also bolsters the tools that we have and strengthens the staff on the ground who are doing this work. DCF, since the bill has, was passed, has been working to clarify what the program will, will be and will not be for um, clients on the ground and is working to publish emergency rules and to communicate with clients. To that end, there's a lot of information out there and not all of the information is true or accurate. So I wanna be clear about a few things. First, please rely on the written materials that are provided by the Agency of Human Services and, and DCF with the DCF's logo on it. These written materials, um, we are, that these written materials are the, the point of truth. 
Um, we know that there are other written materials that are out there to contact individuals outside of the state of Vermont that may not be correct or accurate due to the, the evolution of this program. We do not anticipate anyone losing eligibility on July 1 if they are working with economic services and their reassessments and that they are offered and that they will be offered a, a unit and, and become eligible if they are eligible under the new rules. ESD is the only source of information about eligibility and an individual must be reassessed every month. Okay, I'm gonna slides. Okay, so go to slide two, John, please. So to here, here's the big picture on the situation statewide um, as, we, as we look at the program. We have currently 1,214 individuals who are currently in the hotel and motel program. Um, at the end of this month, we'll be determining eligibility um, based on that, that, those numbers, which will be published as, as soon as we've done the eligibility for July 1. Each room um, in the program right now is costing an average of $153 per night, and we will actively be collecting information on households who fall into the Pandemic Era program, including how many have been tr transitioned to other forms of housing. These measures will be coming online in the next couple of weeks. Next slide. So this slide helps to identify the approximate number of units that will be needed um, over, the, over the next year by district. For, it's important to note that Vermont has a, has a housing shortage and we need units to come on plain and simple. The lack of these units is making this matter more difficult for us to resolve. Even when a household needs services paired with units, the units don't simply exist. I think many people look at the units similar to what we see in our skilled nursing facilities, but many of the units where we provide housing are actual housing units in communities. It could be the house next door to each and every one of them, us. The Rutland, Burlington, and Barrie districts have the highest number of units for, um, that we need. More than half of that need for those that are in the hotel and, and motel program need an actual single family unit or an actual one bedroom unit as you can see here. Okay, next slide. So this also this slide helps to identify the, the units by the number by the type of eligibility of folks coming into the program. As you can see, um, I could say, as you can see, this uh, helps us differentiate what the needs of the individuals are as we begin to move forward, and our case management data will help us drill down even further. Next slide. It's important to note that the Agency of Human Services will continue to partner with community providers and, um, and housing providers to screen and, and assess clients both for their housing needs and their services needs. Clients will now be required to engage in the process and actively participating in this, and that's a new tool that's been provided by uh, H-171. This will make a big difference. When offering an alternative housing option in writing, clients will have 48 hours to respond. Um, this, is from, this is for the pandemic error household, um, household group only. Um, in addition, clients will be required to go back to the process of contributing 30% of their income to their housing costs. And this is what, what has been the requirement of the GA program all along. Next slide. Okay. Eligibility for the pandemic housing program. This information is all available on the DCF's website. Um, a household that has lost its house, and these are the individuals who will be eligible under the pandemic era house, housing program. A household that's lost its housing due to a natural disaster, such as a fly or flood, a household that has been a member who is experiencing domestic violence, a household that is a member who is experiencing a dangerous or life-threatening incident, a household with children who are up to the age 18 um, or 19 if they're attending school a household who is 60 years and older, a household that is, has a disability, and by disability we want to be clear that that means that they're eligible under the federal designation of SSI and SSDI, a household who has a member who is pregnant, 
a household that is pursuing legal re resolution of a violation of their rental housing agreement and a household that has been physically barred from entering their residence through an intentional act by a landlord. Next slide, John. Okay, clients entering after July 1 are eligible, this inf uh, are eligible for the traditional general assistance housing program. That means that if they come in after the, after the first of the month, they will have 28 days um, for continuous enrollment if they are 65 years and older. Um, they are, have SSI or SSDI. They're a family with children 18 years or 19 if they're still in school. They're in their, their third trimester of pregnancy or they're a household that has been assessed for a total of four or more points according to the GA systems rules. Those, are the th those have been in place for many years. In addition, if a household um, has, uh, it falls under the catastrophic category, which trumps the ones above, they get 84 days. As we've talked about here before, that means they've experienced a, f a fire, flood, or natural disaster, the death of a spouse or a minor child, that there are court-ordered uh, construct or constructive eviction or domestic violence. So that's the GA program, and individuals after in July, entering the housing program after July 1 will be subject to that. Next slide. So the, Dep the Department for Children and Families um, is in the process of promulgating rules. The rules will outline specifically how households will maintain their eligibility under the Pandemic Era Program. They also will be communicating that out to the, cl to the clients in, in active communication. The bill passed by the, the passed by the was only passed by the legislature last week, and they're working to make sure that they get the information out to clients prior to the beginning of the month. Next slide. There's been a lot of questions about the security deposits, and I want to make sure that we are clear. The security deposits were provided to clients um, who are participating in the program for a very sh for a very short period of time during the pandemic. Um, we don't know how many people who ha who have uh, been in the program and were should have received a security deposit back receive them. However, we are working with the Attorney General's Office, Consumer Protection Invi um, Division, and Vermont Legal Aid to make sure individuals have the support that they need. I want to clear. I want to make sure that folks are clear. The program that um, that had the security deposits ended on March ended before March 31st, and those deposits should have been paid out at that point in time. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Again, I want to remind um, folks that the Agency of Human Services is actively working on projects with local communities. Um, and we are engaging with them um, related to what's happening under Act 171. Um, we, for those who we have been working with, we've, we've reached out and contacted them already. Again, I want to remind everyone of the resources that are available to help um, on the DCF's website. Um, they also can call ESD at 1-800-479-6151. Thank you and have a good day. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Hanford. Thank you, Secretary. H-171 included more targeted and permanent housing investments, and to accelerate the building of homes we need where we need them, advance the effective date for zoning reforms included in S-100 or the HOME Act. Much of the reforms in S-100, such as allowing duplexes everywhere single-family homes are allowed, and allowing increased density uh, in areas with water and sewer, now become effective July 1 instead of December 2024. It's understandable this accelerated timeline is concerning to some communities. We'll work with them and the regional planning commissions to, to do everything we can to help. But the housing crisis nearly brought us to a brink, brought us to an a impasse over the state budget, and the governor and the legislature all agree we need to do everything we can now to build the housing we need for our fellow Vermonters, not in 18 months. H-171 also included more money for VHIP, the most productive program so far in bringing new housing units online to those uh, exiting homelessness. It also included funding for VHCB, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, to purchase new energy efficient manufactured homes and fill vacant lots in manufactured home communities around the state. It also included more funding to rapidly deploy 
for emergency repairs to mobile homes where families could otherwise be at risk of becoming homelessness, becoming homeless. And it helps our nonprofit mission-driven housing providers increase the number of units set aside to those exiting homelessness. We are targeting these investments to communities with the greatest needs, the largest population of those participating in the pandemic housing program, an ongoing gap analysis of units produced versus unit need by region guides these investments daily. For example, we're working with partners in fire safety and code enforcement to analyze offline properties across the state for rehabilitation opportunities. We're working with other housing funders and lenders to bridge funding gaps to get projects to closing quicker. We're working with regulators at all levels across the state to resolve stall permits and barriers preventing projects from starting construction. It's important to remember that this housing crisis is much bigger than the 1,214 households that are still in the pandemic emergency housing program. Literally tens of thousands of Vermonters from every background are impacted every day by the lack of housing. And our future depends on solving this together. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and that will open up to questions. Um, Governor, um, if I do my arithmetic right, $153 a night is $4,590 a month. I, I hope I did my arithmetic right. Uh, couldn't do any better than that. I mean, that sounds like a lot of a lot of money. Um, it is a lot of money, and it actually was more uh, during the pandemic, uh, and because of the supply demands uh, versus uh, well, what, what the need was. Um, so we understand that. Uh, that's why we want to move uh, to more permanent solutions, uh, get them transitioning out of that program as quickly as possible, uh, and get them into uh, the permanent housing they need. Either one of you want to answer <clears throat> further? Th thank you, Governor. Um, H-171 does require, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, Department for Children and Families to renegotiate these rates. Uh, as the governor mentioned, with the supply and demand, it was really hard, if not impossible, to negotiate when the rooms were all full and we needed all of them. Uh, they are no longer full. We have a, a better position to negotiate, and we'll begin those negotiations uh, very soon with the hotel and motel owners. So it may be going down? Yes. Governor, you talk about the need to have our housing market right now firing on all cylinders. With all of these policy changes, especially with some of the zoning reforms and the duplexing by right, I'm wondering how how far some of that will go um, in as we haven't really acted on Act 250. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned, I think it's like 0.3 or 3%, something like that, of, of the land mass in Vermont um, has exemptions. So where do you see Act 250 playing into this? Yeah, I mean, that's an ongoing conversation we need to have with the legislature. The modernization of Act 250 is something that we've been working on. I think we've had a bill almost every single session uh, that has not survived in its entirety, if at all. Um, so <clears throat> it's vitally important that we look back and modernize this, uh, this, uh, this provision uh, that was put into place over 50 years ago, and it needs to be updated and upgraded. I think most, most um, Vermonters understand that, um, but, um, but we haven't been able to get it across the finish line. And to clarify, the seven or 800 households that have already left the hotels, they are not included in, in that 1,200 number, or they're not included in this program going forward. That's correct. The, uh, the folks who were exited on June 1st are not counted in those 1,214 uh, households. Uh, they are not counted going forward. They may still be eligible in other ways, and I think a, a number of those households are um, applying to see if they do qualify under one of the other categories. Do we have a sense as to, with those reapplications, how many have gotten accepted again, or? I don't know that off the top of my head, but that's something we could, could find out for you. One thing I'm confused about, and maybe someone could clarify, we have the, uh, the program that's 28 days. We have the program that is 84 days and yet are you also saying 
that the, these programs will be continued indefinitely as long as people participate in the services? Is, is that what the message is? We still will have a general assistance yeah. program, yes. Commissioner Winters can speak to this in more detail. I think what the legislature did in, in H-171 is they put a marker in the sand. They said, for those who've been in the, who are in the pandemic error hotel program, which ends on June 30th, they are, um, el they are eligible f under Act 171 to the new provisions. Um, in addition to that, um, we've reset the GA housing program, which is Vermont safety net program for those individuals who are experiencing homelessness. That will be running in the background. Um, in addition, so in addition, so there will be two populations. One population is the one that's been clearly identified, and we'll know exactly what that number is on July 1st. And then the second population um, are those who will be en entering homelessness on an ongoing basis, and it gets us back to our pre-pandemic -pre program. I believe in H-171 there's also a provision for once the state finds an alternative housing option, they, give, they have 48 hours to choose whether or not they, they want to pick that. Can someone just elaborate on what the, you know, the downfall of them not taking that is? Or would they be out of the program if they don't take that? Would they still be in the program? How, how would that shake out? They would be um, not eligible for the program at that point. Just say you know there there are a lot of changes going on, and we're, we've we've only you know learned about the provisions about uh, a week ago, and the governor just barely signed the bill, so there's a lot of detail that we're still trying to work through. So I'm a little reluctant to say anything that causes more confusion or anxiety out there. But it's true there is that 48-hour rule. We are um, implementing administrative rules to clarify. Uh, what it means to engage, what it means to exit people from the program once they've been offered an alternative option. Um, you'll see some more clarity in the administrative rulemaking that'll be coming across soon. Is there any, I know you say it's fluid obviously, but is there any <coughs> kind of regional uh, part of this? So say if someone is in a motel in Barrie and they're from Barrie, will it be in central Vermont or could they be found a, an option in Rutland or something like that, or is, that, is there any rules to that? I, I'm not sure that that's addressed in the rules. I would just say as a general principle, we're trying to help people into permanent options that work best for them. So I think we would take regional considerations into account. We'd do our best if they had a preference, but ultimately I don't think alternative housing option is, is really defined in that way. It doesn't have to be you know, within a certain number of miles or anything like that. We will be looking statewide but hoping to accommodate uh, the needs of the person to make them successful in a permanent housing transition. Thanks. And can I understand you to say that you'll be filing some emergency rules to move up the implementation date of some of the zoning changes? Did I hear that correctly? That was part of the H-71. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, essentially the, um, the signing of the legislation moves up that implementation date from December 24 to July 1st, uh, literally in four days. So giving folks more options to um, build the housing we need in our communities uh, and, and accelerates that process quite a bit. And just to be clear, H-171 had the July date in it? Correct. To move it up? Yep. Okay, thanks. Governor, how are you feeling about the bottle bill? I know you've got some time. So that you have to act on that shortly. How, how are you feeling about that bill? Yeah, well, um, you know my concerns uh, with the bill, um, but I have another <clears throat> 12 hours or so to figure that out. You'll learn about it. I don't think anybody's going to be surprised, but I'll uh, obviously be making a decision today. And what, what are those concerns, just for viewers Cost. that might not remember? Well, costs uh, for one thing um, I think that uh, when you look at the, the bottle um, program uh, redemption program it it was well suited and put into place uh, at a time when we needed it um, but we've done a lot of uh, we've made a lot of improvements over the years especially with uh, recycling zero sort recycling in particular 
um, that was mandated um, by legislative process, put into law uh, that we have to re recycle, and we established this zero sort process. And uh, my feeling is we should double down on that. Um, that's the wave of the future. What about the argument that, that bottles and containers that have a deposit are much more likely to be not only redeemed, but recycled at the same time? So if, if the goal was to recycle clean products as much as possible for future use, wouldn't the bottle deposit law be the way to go? Well, I think it's just, a, you know, I've used this analogy before. It's like a Rube Goldberg type approach uh, to recycling. I mean, think about all the process, all the steps in the way. Uh, when you have to recycle and and redeem uh, your deposits, um, and and what about those uh, those areas that don't have redemption centers? What about the folks? Well, we're talking about housing right now. What if you're living in a single family dwelling, you're living in an apartment, a, a one bedroom uh, facility somewhere, and the and the redemption center is two miles away. What what are you supposed to do with all the bottles? I mean, this is the magnitude of the expansion here. Is dramatic. We're not talking about just some some uh, um, carbonated beverages. We're talking about all, all kinds of things, and it may be expanded beyond that. So I think it's time for us to decide what we want to do here. Do we, are we are we serious about recycling? And if we are, then we should double down on the the system that we put into place and pass in the law. Is part of your thinking? Uh concerned with the possible, if this law goes into effect, uh, some of the recycling centers, the single source people, Casella, have said it's going to increase recycling costs because you're diverting some very valuable You're product. taking all the good stuff out. So what's their incentive? So is that part of your concern? Sure. It's going to it's be all, raising costs? It's, it's, it's the cost and the complication of what we're trying to do. And I just think there's a simpler way to do it. But we need to, to focus on that in order to make it successful. I think it's been highly successful. I see people that, uh, and I've always taken recycling serious, uh, and uh, maybe it's just part of my frugal nature. I just like to get as mo much as I can out. I don't like to throw things away. Um, so, so I've seen you know other businesses and friends and family members who have really taken it on and, and really um, have, are starting to recycle much more uh, than they put into their regular uh, rubbish at this point. Um, so I think it's working, uh, but I think it could be work, working better. And we need to focus on that. So whether it is the impeachment investigation into the Franklin County sheriffs, we have the Orange County audit that couldn't really happen just historically with sheriffs. And I know some legislators are working things for maybe next session and down the road to kind of maybe have some more oversight on them. And with all this going on, I guess, do you feel that not necessarily an overhaul to how the sheriff's departments works, but do you believe there needs to be some change and kind of just going crazy right now? Well, we did uh, we did pass that provision, uh, this, uh, and I signed that into law uh, with some more oversight. And I thought that was a, a good step forward. Uh, but um, we'll see what they have to offer the next session. Uh, back to the housing discussion. You mentioned negotiations with legislative leaders, and obviously they had implications with the budget. Um, but for you, what was that negotiation like, knowing that if you got a deal done, that your veto probably wouldn't yeah. would get over well, it? It wasn't loss on me that I was working against myself. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it was the right thing to do um, because uh, we know we need housing. That's a, you know, we have a crisis on our hands, and we need to do everything we can uh, to to forward that. And I saw an opportunity uh, for us to get some of the provisions that we've been actively pursuing during the legislative session, but we're unsuccessful in doing and, and accomplishing. Um, many of those uh, were cut from uh, from some of uh, some of their uh, their bills. So I thought it was a good opportunity for us to get more of what we needed, more tools uh, to, to provide assistance, and, uh, and for them to get what they needed as well. And how do you view your role in Vermont's government now? You obviously, you're frustrated off the top about the veto overrides. And you know obviously, um, everyone knows the, the climate in, in the state right now. Um, I was just wondering, you know, how do you view where you are and, yeah. and kind of your decisions? Well, again, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to oversee um, and trying to make sure that 
uh, we aren't exceeding our ability uh, to pay and to keep our economy going and, and, uh, and, and not make it so expensive here that nobody wants to live here. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate uh, some of the things that passed this year. I, I talked to a lot of folks uh, throughout Vermont and, uh, and some have come to me unsolicited and said, I can't believe what they're doing in, in Montpelier. Can't you do something about that? They just assume that the governor has the power to stop anything uh, from happening that is detrimental to the state. And I, you know, we're so out of balance that uh, that's just not the case right now. So again, we'll see what happens in the next election. Hopefully we'll, we'll get some balance. I, I don't think any, any one party uh, should have that much power uh, that they can uh, just uh, sidestep the governor. I just think that um, the governor has a role to play. What are you doing to, to reach out to more Republican candidates, to get more Republicans Look, involved? I, I, I've said this before. Uh, it doesn't have to be Republicans. I just want more uh, legislators with common sense, more centrist, moderates, that understand how to balance a checkbook. You know, you've said several times that the fact that Democrats have a supermajority in the legislature and voters decided to elect a Republican governor uh, was sort of a balancing uh, power balance. Do you think that's the case, or is it a little out of line? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they did that knowingly. I don't know if they went in and said, geez, you know, we ought to have a Republican governor, and we need all these, uh, these legislators who... Uh, who are left of center um, to to come in and make sure that we get what we need in in the end? I don't think they did that. I think they they know their legislators, or they think they know their legislators, and they think that they're they're uh, forwarding um, their ideas and and keeping their um, pocketbooks in mind. Uh, you know when they're we're voting on different measures, um, but they also know me, and uh, it's something they've gotten to know me better uh, over the last decade. Um, and, and so, you know, all I can say is I was elected, um, I think, uh, with, a, with a clear message. We need to grow the economy. We need to make Vermont more affordable and protect the most vulnerable. And for the most part, I think we've done that. Unfortunately, some of the measures that were passed this session uh, take us backwards and unravels some of the good work we've done, especially with taxes and fees. The Supreme Court today uh, struck down affirmative action 6-3. Any thoughts on how yeah, it's different from Montan's? I just heard that uh, coming into the press briefing. Um, I don't have uh, any clear thoughts on that. Uh, I don't know as I was surprised to hear that they did, um, but it's a long 237-page uh, report, and uh, I think we'll, we'll glean a lot from that. I don't know what effect that will have on Vermont, or how broad it is either, and uh, we'll all be interested in, in figuring that out and see if it has any detrimental effects to, to Vermont. Uh, Governor, given the internal problems at the Agency of Digital Services outlined by Auditor Hoffer, the leadership transition, and the repeat outages, it, do you think, it, is it wise per H-291 give the ADS chief the lead role in cybersecurity, not only for the state, but for the private sector as well? Um, where do I start? Um, I think ADS, uh, this was something we established and made it an agency. ADS is one of the best things we've done as an organization. Probably doesn't get all the headlines uh, or the notoriety unless things go, go wrong. Um, but, um, but I think it's one of the best things we've done. Previous to having an agency oversee all of the new technology, uh, we did this in silos. Every agency and department had their own systems. Um, they weren't connected. They weren't talking with one another. Uh, and, uh, and it was clear that uh, they had no uh, common theme. Uh, ADS has done an amazing job in bringing that together. Uh, so that, and I would say, uh, if we hadn't had the agency of uh, digital services, we'd be paying a lot more right now, and we'd have a lot more cybersecurity issues as a result, because nobody be overseeing this. Not one common uh, agency would be overseeing that. And uh, again, I uh, 
my hats off to the Agency of Digital Services for all they've done and continue to do. And, uh, and those, the outages uh, that we've seen of late, it was a severed fiber optic cable in Washington, D.C., both of them. That's nothing that we have much control over. Um, in terms of leadership, uh, and I want to give uh, uh, Secretary Naylor a, an opportunity. Um, I may regret this because he's, uh, he's retiring as of uh, tomorrow, I think. Um, so I may regret this, but I want to give him an opportunity uh, to, to answer as well because he's a long time state employee, given well over 30 years uh, to the state, uh, worked in different agencies and departments. And uh, again, uh, when uh, Secretary Quinn decided to step down. Uh, he was deputy secretary and we put him on in charge and we knew all along that he was going to be retiring soon. We'd hoped he'd stay on uh, much longer, but uh, he has other things he'd like to do as well. So Secretary Naylor, do you want to add anything or talk about uh, what you've seen? Uh, because your perspective's a little bit different uh, than most of us having this broad perspective and seeing this from the ground up long before we had a lot of uh, uh, of digital uh, issues, I guess. Uh, thank you, Governor. Thank you for the, the the wonderful comments about the NC Digital Services. It's been a point of pride to be part of the creation of this agency. And I will say, uh, I was at transportation when this administration came in and uh, the governor used executive order to create ADS. And the city government at that time was in the technology space full of has and have nots and there was a lot of agencies and departments that didn't have the same level of technology access that we do today the central the audit alone was possible because of the transparency that the agency of digital services has brought to state government we have worked tirelessly with the administration and then the legislature to put in place cybersecurity protocols, controls, investments. We have a 24 by seven security operations center now that was never gonna be possible with the silos that the governor mentioned before. Those are all possible because of his commitment in the agency. Where we're at right now, having done things like realized over 35 million in direct savings, having wiped out a $7 million deficit to the IT fund, established a modernization fund for the state of Vermont to continue to move forward, modernizing legacy applications like motor vehicles, unemployment insurance, our, our HR and finance systems are all successes. And when we look at what the auditor focused on, and, and I want to just kind of help clarify here, there was performance measures were key to their, their recommendations. Those performance measures were not performance measures related to the agency of digital services. Those were not performance measures that were related to the actual project or the technology. They were, how does uh, the result yield positive outcomes for Vermonters. We're starting now to re, re, uh, measure things like this technology will reduce processing time by 10% or things like that. And where we need, and I, I've got to give the, the auditor in his office credit, these were insightful things about how allowing us to mature and continue this vision that the governor had for how technology could be better done in the state of Vermont. So when you look at all of that as a package and you look at that, we are fully engaged in as a leader in the state of Vermont now, regardless of public sector or private sector, when it comes to cybersecurity, we feel strongly that the role that we have, which is two positions on an 11 person council that does not have rulemaking, right? This is meant to start open lines of communication, assess where everybody is at and start to look to identify what needs to happen so that Vermonters information is protected or more importantly, their critical services, whether it's water, sewer, electric, hospital, are all protected to a certain standard. And that's why we're, we're excited about doing this and I feel that the trust that the governor has put in us to accomplish this is uh, well-founded at this time. Thank you, Governor. Well, again, uh, Sean, I just uh, one more question for you. Um, because we were at the an award ceremony last week, the week before, honoring some of the long-standing state employees we have. 
and uh, the talented uh, state employees we have. And, and uh, it's vast and deep when you think about it. And uh, I remember there was some who had been there for 40 years and, and uh, were being honored. But uh, and my dad was, uh, was a state employee as well, worked for the highway department uh, in the early days. But Sean, maybe just where did you start um, in state government? Where, what uh, agency or department? I started in transportation. I actually started on the engineering side. I started counting cars in 1988, uh, moved up to highway design and then moved into construction. And then from there, I kind of started to get involved with technology in the little 90s and have had a tremendous opportunity to help Vermonters from that lens since then. And I just want to clarify, he said counting cars and not cards. Just want to make sure you know that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious, what, what's the biggest cyber security threat that the state of Vermont faces? It's, it's like, you know, I'm going to let Sean answer this, but it's always the weakest link, right? Every single state employee is, is a link in all of this. And, and we have, I, I, that's the other thing that has grown tremendously. The number of cyber attacks we have on a daily basis is astronomical. And, and Sean, you could probably tell us off the top of your head, but this has grown in thousands uh, over the last well, five, six years. We, we suppress in the millions a month at this point. And it, it fluctuates depending on like geopolitical situations, you know, certain things happening around the world will influence it. It's hard to say one technical thing. The, what we have focused on through the governor's support is really an education. We have a strong training program to train staff because often the person that clicks on the wrong link is your weakest link, as the governor pointed out. Uh, but we also have invested in, in strengthening our, our uh, perimeter to make sure that things like ransomware are not successfully washed in the state. You know, every, there is no one thing. It, every night I wake up worrying about tens of things in the cyberspace because it is a constantly evolving and accelerating, as you, can, you may or may not can imagine. Chat GPT and the acceleration of artificial intelligence uh, is being used just as quickly for the bad actors as we are trying to figure out how to use it to help us keep them off our doorstep. So there is no one thing, but just being cognizant and uh, aware is the first step. I think I was just trying to get a sense of, you know, are, are these criminals trying to get ransoms or hack into the all, state financial system all, or all the above. foreign governments? Yeah, I think it's all, all the above, a, a mix of everything. All, all the above. Yeah. I'm sorry, Kevin. No, no, I think we're saying, <laughs> saying the same thing. I've listened to you for so long that... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, uh, he understands very well. And I, I think it was summed up once uh, for me really well that when you realize that probably a significant portion, their goal is to undermine democracy, right? And when you think about that, it's there's ransomware, there's all these vehicles, but that is, that is one of the things they're really trying to do is to use technology to undermine democracy. So we do not take it lightly here in the state. No other questions about cybersecurity? <laughs> I might just see, I think we only have one reporter on the phone, but if Tim McQuiston from Vermont Business Magazine has a question, I'll give him a chance now. Hi, Governor. Um, the, the revenue report came out, and it was, again, uh, disappointing, especially the personal income tax. And I know that you don't like to speculate, but you have to have contingency plans, I'm sure. Like, I remember Governor Shumlin uh, having to just, I think in August, it's a couple of months after the budget had been implemented, enacted, had to cut across the board because of there there wasn't enough revenue to meet the spending. Do you have a contingency plan if, if things you know continue on this track? Yeah, I mean we'll be meeting with the the emergency board and um, talking about what we're seeing in the future. We did have the economists on last uh, I think it was last summer, uh, well before the session started, and they had warned <clears throat> that they were 
they were concerned uh, about uh, revenue projections and and uh, things were going so well here in the state of Vermont that many people think it's never going to end. Well, I've been through a couple of these and uh, they do end and they end quickly. Um, so we will take whatever measures uh, we need to take, but we're hopeful um, that we'll be able to, to continue um, to provide uh, for the services we need. I mean, we'll, we'll prioritize in that respect, um, but, um, but I'm still, still hopeful uh, that we'll continue to do good work, uh, regardless of my opposition to the, the state budget, for instance, or any of the bills that I um, that I vetoed. Um, now they're law, and we'll adhere to them, and we'll do the best we can uh, to make sure that uh, Vermont is as competitive as possible and continues to bring people into this state and tries to attract businesses to come here, and uh, and so that we don't suffer, so the Vermonters don't suffer. But, um, but again, I'm, um, I've been concerned about those economic storm clouds that I say are on the horizon, and we're starting to see them uh, with the uh, revenue reports. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Last call. Thank you all very much. Thank you.